to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, Episode 4, Dead, Dying, and Depraved. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, with my lovely co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hello, everyone. How are you doing today, Michelle? I am fantastic. How are you, Joseph? I'm incredibly awesome. We have a very busy show today, a lot of topics to discuss. Uh, We'll be talking about a few celebrity deaths uh, that we've uh, had to endure in the last week. We have a popular game show host who's facing some serious health concerns. Then we'll talk about uh, Steven Spielberg and his battle with Netflix for the Academy Awards. Uh, We'll also talk about Ian McKellen, um, who made some questionable comments that he's backpedaling on now. And we'll finally finish up the news discussions with uh, the British Royal Family, releasing some new social guidelines, uh, social media guidelines. And then we will finish up as always, with our insightful picks of the week. A follow-up to last week where we talked about uh, Luke Perry from 90210. Yeah, that was very sad. uh, Having suffered a stroke, he has since passed away since then. Just a programming note on that. Our sympathies to the friends and family there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come as a surprise to me. I kind of figured, given the... Uh, lack of information that was coming out of his camp, that it was far more severe than most people probably thought. Right, and that's what we kind of, we were hoping for the best last week when we were discussing it, and, you know, yeah, unfortunately. 52, though, that's that's unfortunate. Yeah, very young. Also, in the celebrity obituaries this week, Jan Michael Vincent, who shot the fame in the 80s for his role as string fellow Hawk in the television series Airwolf, has passed away as well. Uh, He was in a series of films in the 70s, appearing with the likes of Burt Reynolds and Kim Basinger. Uh, He was also a staple on some uh, television shows, including Lassie, Bonanza, and Gunsmoke. Uh, And his last appearance was in 2002's White Boy. But I think everybody remembers him from Airwolf as the helicopter, the rogue helicopter pilot of the the super Airwolf helicopter. Right, right. And that series <clears throat> ran from 84 to 86. And I have to confess, I was a huge fan of mm-hmm. the series. Loved it. The third third season, they kind of went off the rails with it and swapped the entire cast out. But... That's largely attributed to Jan Michael Vincent and his pretty severe cocaine addiction Mm -hmm. at the time. Right, right. Some significant substance abuse issues. But while the show was in its heyday, he was actually the most uh, highest paid performer on television at the time. Right, I remember that. Yeah, he was pulling in uh, an estimated 200 grand per episode, which I guess in hindsight now is not that significant. Right, but but back then. Back then it was huge. Absolutely. Uh, he's had several um, brushes with with death, I guess you could say, and health issues. In, in 2012, he wound up suffering from a rare infection that actually cost him his, his right leg as an, mm-hmm. as an amputation. Right, I did re- uh, read that. But uh, from everything that I've seen, his death was not attributed to that. He was, sta- a, a form of death was cardiac arrest. Mm-hmm. So he is no longer with us. Uh, He was 73 years old as well, so that's unfortunate. He had a troubled life after Mm Airwolf. Yeah. In continuingly morbid news... (laughs) um, (laughs) Will will it ever pick up? (laughs) (laughs) um, Alex Trebek... Yeah, that uh, was sad. Came out Or is sad, I should say. He's still here, so... Yes, came out with a statement saying that he's suffering from stage 4 pancreatic cancer... Uh, he is 78. Uh, what what I thought was, was interesting was he felt obligated to come out and, and mm-hmm. discuss with his audience 
in his statement, he basically said he didn't want people finding out from a rumor site or something right, else. Right, TMZ or something like that. He he wanted people to know the facts. He was completely open about it. He was in high spirits. He was even mm-hmm. joking around saying, you know, I have to keep hosting because under the terms of my contract, <laughs> I have to host Jeopardy for three more years. So. Yeah, yeah. And and the thing is, I think the last time I I happened to watch or, or see him, he did look a little bit thinner. Yeah. You know, so it, you know, I'm sure that was probably a reason for, for coming forward and being so forthright with it just because okay people are going to start wondering or if i'm going to certain doctors people are going to start yeah you know speculating let me just come right out you know i have nothing to hide well and what i thought was interesting was he had done several interviews in the past couple of months where the question kept kept coming up as to who his successor should be Mm mm-hmm uh, and yeah, he's he's seventy eight. He's close to retirement. Right, so, right. Well, he's past retirement for most average people. But you know, the fact that they've been talking about his successor, I think, seemed to strike me as kind of odd with this with this mm, news here. Right, because in entertainment, for what he does, you know, it it you could go on forever. It's not Absolutely. like oh, well, you don't look your age anymore or you know you, you well look at bob barker how old was I mean, he was what 82 i think something when, when he, he finally, finally retired the the pencil stick microphone right right just to throw a a stunning statistic out there uh the five-year survival rate across all stages of pancreatic cancer uh, is nine percent on average mm. so it is a tough one to beat but what I also thought was interesting was the outpouring of support that came out. Pat oh, Sajak absolutely. Being, being one of them. Oh, well, you figure he's been hosting Wheel of Fortune for, you know, probably almost just as long as, it, yeah. it, you know, Alex has been doing, you know, Jeopardy. It, they kind of started the shows, you know, right that whole time. Uh, Merv Griffin, you know, game show. You know, you had all these game shows that were... That were on, you know, TV at the time, and they're really the only two that are are still around. That is true. That's true. Uh, there were well wishes that came from a number of Jeopardy champions. Uh, Ken Jennings being one of them, probably the most famous. So sure. Um, so you know, everyone is is pulling for him. I mean, we, oh, we certainly would love to see him beat this, if uh, for no other reasons than to not be one of the those that statistic, mm-hmm. that nine percent statistic. Yeah, absolutely. On to other news that has less to do with death and more to do with ego, I think. <laughs> Steven Spielberg, and, and again, this is in the wake of our, our Oscars discussions that we've had. Mm-hmm. Uh, Steven Spielberg is now facing some backlash for urging the Academy to block Netflix from eligibility at the Oscars. So before He's a purist, I guess. Is, yeah, you know. but before we get into the deep discussion, I think it's worthwhile to talk about how it how you become eligible mm-hmm. as a movie right right so and this is this is taken directly from the academy awards website their bylaws of eligibility and it's not the entire subsection but it's basically what governs movies so you need to be a feature length which they define as anything over 40 minutes then you need to be publicly exhibited and they have technical specifications either 35 or 70 millimeter film or in 14, uh, 24 or 48 frame progressive scan digital cinema with a minimum projector resolution of 2048 by 1080. And then it goes into a, a deep granular dive on what digital cinema is. Okay. The only thing that's worthwhile taking away from that is that Blu-ray format is not considered digital cinema. And, and they explicitly call that out, and I thought that was kind of interesting in the rules, almost as if they were targeting sites like netflix okay there has to be paid admission in a commercial motion picture theater in los angeles county okay so it has to at some point be shown yes and they they qualify in los that. angeles though correct and they qualify that, that a little to. bit further right it doesn't have to appear nationwide <clears throat> just in los angeles county. okay uh, they also say qualifying run of seven consecutive days with three screenings per day uh, one of which must be between the hours of 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. <laughs> okay. Um, which, so that 
somebody's watching it at night, I guess. So, right, you know, right. It just seems... Okay. Then they go on to, 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 to define the advertising, where advertise, it must be advertised and what they termed as exploited, which I'm not really sure what they mean by that. They don't hmm. define that. Okay. During the Los Angeles County run, and it must be released within the awards year, which makes perfect sense. Right, right. And it also says that films that receive their first public exhibition or distribution in any manner, other than a theatrical motion picture, will not be eligible. So, I guess to interpret that, if a movie is released on Netflix before it appears in the Los Angeles County theatrical release... Then it wouldn't... Then it would not be eligible. Okay. So, as long as they go through the motions and it appears in the theater, they follow the guidelines for that and then it gets released then technically it should be right up and, for and the the films that were up for a nomination from netflix mm -hmm. abide it by these rules okay spielberg claims that netflix has been negatively affecting the theatrical experience uh, he's argued that netflix should compete for emmys in the television area but not for oscars in the Academy of Motion Pictures, despite the fact that they clearly meet the standards set forth by the Motion Picture in, in, uh, right, right. Academy. But I, I, I see his point because there are made-for-TV movies that the other channels do that they're not eligible, obviously, for the Academy Awards because they are just shown on television. You know, they're never shown in right in theaters. So, for the most part, where do you go to see Netflix? You see it, you know, in your home, on your phone, you know, while you're in a doctor's office. You don't usually go to a, a theater. But obviously, Netflix kind of found the loophole and said, well, as long as we do this, this, and this. Well, and I guess that's where my question is. Is Netflix gaming the system? Or is Netflix using the system's rules as they were intended. Right. I mean, if you fulfill all the obligations of, of qualification to be nominated, right. why shouldn't you be nominated? And the other thing, too, is that if the voting members of the Academy didn't feel it was a substantial uh, nominee, why would they vote for it? Why did, you know, Roma win so many awards this past Oscar season? Because everybody thought it was a great movie. You, you know, they don't win, you know, just because, you know. And that's a very good point. You know, they're not... Just because you're nominated doesn't mean you're going to win. It still has to be a certain level of quality in order to win. Right. And if the Academy is picking you as a winner, then clearly you're you're meeting those requirements. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um because it's voted on. I mean, it's not an arbitrary decision. Right. It's it's not based off of how much you earned in the box office. It's not based off of what critics, you know, um, said about you. It, it it is clearly done based off of people that are able to to vote. Right. Well, uh, in response to Spielberg's appeal to the Board of Governors, uh, director Ava uh, Duvernay who received her first Oscar nomination in 2017 for her Netflix documentary, 13th, wrote a letter to the uh, Academy Board of Directors basically saying, and I quote, uh, this is a Board of Governors meeting and regular branch members can't be there. But I hope if this is true that you'll have filmmakers in the room or read statements from directors like me who feel differently. So there's there's pushback inside the industry itself mm -hmm. from people who don't want to limit the scope of the Academy Awards mm -hmm. and eliminate really quality programming. Right. In this past awards, Netflix had 15 nominations. Mm -hmm. So and they won a good portion of them. Mm -hmm. And some of them were also in other for other films and other uh, categories, not just. For Roma, um, I happened to catch on Netflix. Um, it was the winner of uh, the best documentary, and it was the documentary was shown on on Netflix. And I know usually, you know, most years any of the documentaries are live action or you know the shorts or you know I usually never 
know about them or never see them or have an opportunity to watch them. But because of Netflix, I was able to to enjoy this one and it was and it was well done. And I was, you know, I was pleased that they had won an award for for their film. And and I think that speaks to the response that the formal response that Netflix had Mm -hmm. to Spielberg's objections. They tweeted the following. We love cinema. Here are some things we also love in a sort of tongue-in-cheek mm-hmm. bullet point list. Access for people who can't always afford or live in towns without theaters. Letting everyone everywhere enjoy releases at the same time. Giving filmmakers more ways to share art. These are not mutually exclusive. And I think those points very well strike at the heart of the matter that Netflix reaches a larger different portion it services more fans of entertainment Mm -hmm. and i think the antiquated approach that spielberg has where he basically wants to turn the the academy awards into this elitist Mm -hmm. um show and and restrict very good talent Mm -hmm. um there's a whole pool of talent out there i mean you just even if you just want to look at it from a dollar standpoint Mm -hmm. The billions of dollars that Netflix is pouring into original content, which we talked about, which the we other talked week. about last week, is paying off. Mm-hmm. Um, they produce incredibly poignant and well scripted, well researched, and well um, produced documentaries, mm-hmm. films. Uh, yes, yeah, some of the, what they do should be classified for Emmys because they're serial programs. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, but a good portion of what they do are the quality of feature length films. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think if you're producing the material, you're abiding by the Academy's mm-hmm. rules, then there's absolutely no reason why you should not be considered for a prestigious award like that. Absolutely. And if you start restricting that, then the prestige of that award starts to diminish mm-hmm. rapidly. No, yeah, I agree. Um, I, I think this is a case of Spielberg probably being a little too purist and a little too old-fashioned in his mm. approach to things. And I think it's it's a detriment to the industry, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next thing we have on the docket here is Gandalf himself, <laughs> uh, Anne McKellen, is taking heat for some comments that he made. So he was doing an interview for a podcast, hashtag Queer AF. Uh, He was asked about sexual misconduct allegations against director Brian Singer, who he's worked with in the X-Men franchise, Mm -hmm. and actor Kevin Spacey. His statement, and I quote, with a couple of names you've mentioned of people I work with, both of them were in the closet. Hence, all their problems as people and their relationship with other people. If they had been able to be open about themselves and their desires, they wouldn't have started abusing people in the way they're being accused. Now, that statement can be interpreted different ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, I And I think, and, and based on, on his backpedaling on this, Basically, what he was saying is that if society didn't stigmatize homosexuals and force them to stay in the closet to protect their careers and themselves, mm. people wouldn't be forced to, to uh, I'll say, make decisions they shouldn't be making. That's the gist of what he was trying to say. What came out and, and what he took heat for was he's basically blaming sexual predatory practices on these men for being in the closet. And and I think that's a misstatement and a disservice to, I don't even want to say just to homosexuals, but to everybody. Mm-hmm. I mean, at that point in time, you're trying to justify the actions that these people made by blaming their actions on society. Right, where, you know, if the allegations were coming from somebody of the opposite sex... Would it still, you know, it, it has nothing to do with... With being in the closet. And being in the closet, right. as we've, you know, we talked about the other day, de- you know, the other week with, you know, the the misconduct, you know, and the allegations and, you know, 
If you're in the closet it, about it anything at that point in time, it's being in the closet about being a sexual predator. Right. Exactly. Exactly. You know, not straight or gay or yeah, whatever. Yeah, I don't think it has anything to do with, with that. Um, he went on, McKellen went on to, to sort of bury himself even further in this by saying, uh, those accused of sexual misconduct should not necessarily be forced to cease working. And I took exception to that because in cases of the entertainment industry here, mm-hmm. the situations in which people are abusing people in a sexual way is industry specific here. Mm-hmm. Basically, it's, you know, if you don't do what I want you to do, you're not going to have a career. You're not going to have a career. So if you're in a position of power mm-hmm. and you're using that power, you're abusing that power to assault other people, mm-hmm. then by no means should you still be allowed to be right. in that position of power while an investigation is going Absolutely. on. Absolutely. And again, we talked about this, you know, last week as well, where depending on what your job is, you shouldn't be able to still be in that career. It's one thing if you're an accountant that works from home and you're being accused of, you know, sexual misconduct. Well, if you're at home and you're not coming in contact with anybody, fine. You can continue to work while right. something's being investigated. But if you, you know, if you're a, a high school teacher and you're being accused of, you know, misconduct with your students, well, of course you shouldn't be allowed back in the school to to work. So exactly. if you're an actor or a director and you have to be in contact with people of of all genders and of all, you know, orientations, you know, you shouldn't be allowed to be with those other people while an investigation, you know, is going on. And that's not to say that you should not be considered innocent until proven guilty. But Absolutely. But you have to take an approach of an overabundance of caution mm-hmm. for the potential victims and victims that are out there. Right. Where it should the, the allegations prove true, then you've exposed so many other people mm-hmm. to that potential predator right. in the process. Right. You know, I'm I'm firmly of the belief that if you're in that position and accused... You can't actively work in that position, but that's not to say that you shouldn't be continually compensated Mm -hmm. while you're stepping down. Um, But to expose other potential victims Mm -hmm. to that kind of predatory practice is is reckless, Mm -hmm. uh, and it's unfair to those other victims. Mm -hmm. He did issue an apology on Twitter where he says, as part of an extended podcast recently, I suggested that if closeted people were instead open about their sexuality they wouldn't abuse others that of course is wrong my intention was to encourage the lgbt audience i was addressing to be proud and open about their sexuality in doing so my point was clumsily expressed i would never ever trivialize or condone abuse of any kind so yeah he was trying to make a valid point that was intended to be encouraging to the LGBT community. And I don't know if he just stumbled over it. Mm. And that um, could have been too. It, yes. And it's it's difficult to believe someone as eloquent as Ian McKellen could Absolutely. have expressed himself so ineloquently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but I guess it happens. Mm-hmm. Just for the record, um, both Singer and Spacey have denied the allegations of sexual misconduct against them, um, and lawyers for Spacey were to attend a pretrial hearing for the Star's sexual assault case on Monday. So there's been no court cases to prove them innocent Mm -hmm. or guilty one way or the other. Right, right. It it still has to play itself out in court. Right. But this this is a situation where... It's a sensitive subject. Um, Absolutely, it is. And and I think also it doesn't matter whether what your sexual orientation is. If you are predetermined, you know, if, if you're a predator, you're a predator no matter what. You know, so coming out of the closet, you know, would that have made things easier for some people? No, I don't, you know. And and the other thing, too, is also the, the other person that, that was the victim you know did you know not saying that they were um 
in the wrong of anything, but, you know, maybe there were, I don't know, signals crossed or, you know, again, the, the whole, you know, was it just hugging? Was it this? Was it that? You know, I think in some cases there's a little bit of oversensitivity in some cases, not to say that in some cases it's it's not right or it, or it is right or, or whatnot. It just seems like every little thing now is being, you know, under the microscope. You well, know, or... and I agree, <clears throat> but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because for so long these things have been oh, absolutely. stigmatized mm-hmm. and brushed under the carpet and the victims have been terrified to mm-hmm. come forward. Absolutely. The other thing that, that I would point out is while this isn't industry specific, it could be situational. Mm-hmm. Um, for instance, people in a position of power tend to abuse that power. And I Absolutely. think that's human yeah. nature. Oh, and that's across the board, no yes. matter where yes. where you are. Which is why, you know, contrary to McClellan's other statement, if you're in that position of power and you're accused of this, you should not be allowed to retain that mm-hmm. position of power while you're being investigated. Absolutely. So we'll see how this one plays out in court, mm-hmm. but I, I think uh, I think Gandalf has learned his his lesson <laughs> in making his statements now. Yeah. The uh, last piece of uh, poignant entertainment news: uh, we go to England for this one. The British royal family has released social media guidelines uh, that will govern the royal family. Clarence House and Kensington Palace uh, communications. And this was in response to a flood of sexist and racist remarks that were aimed specifically at Kate Middleton and Meghan Markle, um, some of which have been rather alarming. Mm -hmm. Um, In the official statement from the Royal Press Office, they uh, said, we ask that anyone engaging with our social media channels Uh, shows courtesy, kindness, and respect for all members of our social media communities. We reserve the right at our discretion whether uh, contributions to our social media channel breach our guidelines. We reserve the right to hide or delete comments made on our channels as well as block users who do not follow these guidelines. We also reserve the right to send any comments we deem uh, deem appropriate to law enforcement authorities for investigation as we feel necessary or is required by law. Now, they do go on to define what those guidelines mm-hmm. are further, but that's the general statement of, right. of what they put out. I don't think there's a disagreement between you and I about the cesspool that social media oh, can be. Oh, my God. It's... <laughs> and, and that's the thing is I think over time it's just gotten worse you know, people feel that they can sit behind their computer and spew whatever hatred they they want without any repercussions. And, you know, it's almost the fact of people, you know, they would never say it in public. They would never say it face to face. Right. But behind a screen, they they can let go and they do. And. You know, there are people that have very thick skin and just brush it off. But yet there are times when there are, you know, there is a statement that comes out about something and you kind of you, you kind of have to take it seriously. And, you know, especially yeah. when it's a death threat or something like that, because you don't know who that psychopath is that's sitting behind the screen. You know, what arsenal does he have, you know, sitting behind him that he's going to go off and, and do what he says he's going to do? Absolutely. And, and there were two confirmed violent threats through social media towards the rules just in the last year mm-hmm. uh, that when they were investigated, they were they basically felt they thwarted mm-hmm. what could have been an attack. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a recent analysis by an advocacy group called Hope Not Hate of more than 5,000 tweets containing anti megan hashtags, and they determined that about 20 accounts are responsible for about <laughs> 70% of those tweets. Some people just have way too much time on their hands yeah. you know, when it comes to that. Well, to take it even a step further, um, many of those accounts were also associated with 
political hashtags, including uh, Brexit and MAGA, are oh. Make America Great Again. Friends. Wow, let me act surprised. So it's, I don't know. To me, it's it's. I don't see there being a need, especially for the royal family, to be on social media. Uh, there are commercial advantages to it. There are business advantages to it. Mm -hmm. Um, it's difficult to run any kind of nationwide or worldwide business without being on it. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that the royal family or politicians or individuals need to be on social media. Well, and I think in, in some respects when it comes to that, it gives people access to them. It, it makes them, you know, seem like regular folk but they're not is my point oh absolutely and and they should be you know a higher you know regard for you know for them but i could definitely see you know politicians though having some sort of social media account so that you know their constituents or you know can can get in contact with them you know but you know, does it need to be as flooded as, you know, like, does every royal member of the royal family need their own account? Or could they just have one, you know, basic account, you know, or, you know, the, the White House and the Senate, you know, do you need to have all these individual, you know, accounts? I think the more accounts you have, the more you're allowing the floodgates open to, you know, more hate coming in you know, than maybe good being done. Well, and the way that I look at it is Britain has had a royal family in place for over 1,500 years now, and they've only had social <laughs> media for 15 years. Right. So somehow they've managed they to managed make it to work. <laughs> they've managed to keep the kingdom going without Twitter for quite some time. Oh, I agree. Um, and you look at the United States. You know, the country has been in existence for... Not 200, as long. <laughs> 250 years without without Twitter. Uh, all of a sudden, we get a you know political entity now who lives on Twitter <laughs> and starts more fires than anything on right. Twitter. He's no. the biggest troll on Twitter. Right. No, I I, I, so I definitely agree with that. I but think it's a detriment at this point in time to these forms of government to have that kind of access because. The, these institutions were not built around that kind of access, especially the royal family. The royal family has always been above the common mm -hmm. people. That's the whole point of royalty. Right, right. But I think also in terms of getting news and information and statements out, think about, you know, you know, 200 years ago, you, you know, it took how many weeks for news of something to get released or be known about, um, you know, sometimes months before a town would hear about something or, or you know. Well, so. Yeah, but I mean, if you want to look at technology like that, television and radio. Mm -hmm. Television and radio have been around about 100 years now. Right. And they've served the public quite well to inform the Absolutely. public. Absolutely. Uh, I don't need to have the presidents or, you know, the princesses sending me a direct message on my Twitter account. I that don't, would be kind of cool. I don't need <laughs> that level of access right. to them. No, I agree. It doesn't serve a purpose to me. Well, yeah, and, and no, I, I definitely agree that, you know, there's a certain level of, okay, this is kind of nice, and then there's the over the top. You know, and that's, I'm okay with the, you know, the the mid le mid to lower level. Like, you want to, you know, post something, you know, about something historic, that's fine. But the over-the-top trolling, like our current president does, then, you know, that's where it's over, so, over and above. So, just to compare the United Kingdom to the United States... <laughs> um, basically the rules came out and said they're going to censor their social media. Mm -hmm. And they're perfectly fine with mm -hmm. that. Um, President Trump tried to do the same thing. Uh, he had this nasty tendency of blocking people on Twitter 
who didn't agree with him, argued with him, um, pointed out his errors and his lies and, and whatnot. Basically, he wanted to silence his detractors. Well, in May of 2018, Judge Naomi Reese uh, Buckwald ruled that it was unconstitutional for the president <clears throat> to block users on Twitter for their comments that opposed to him because it was a violation of their First Amendment right to free speech. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought it was kind of an interesting parallel that our government tried to do what the royals are trying to do, but our judicial system wouldn't allow it because our Constitution doesn't allow it. Right. I don't know if this was a good precedent to um, give Twitter a sense of legitimacy saying that they are constitutionally protected. I think that mm. that scares me as much as a president who relies on it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's an interesting contrast to this latest move by the Royals mm -hmm. who don't have a problem silencing their, their critics or, or right. whoever. Now, granted, they're using uh, violent threats and hate speech as a reason to silence them. But oh. the fact that they're silencing them at all mm -hmm. is, I think, a major statement. Absolutely. That moves us on to our insightful picks of the week. And Michelle, I will defer to you first. Well, thank you. So my insightful pick, going back to our good friend Netflix, <laughs> really need to get them as a sponsor. That would be awesome. Um, would be a uh, web series called The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. And I believe I kind of mentioned them last week um, when I was comparing my last week's pick of the Umbrella Academy to uh, reminding me a bit of The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. So it's an adaptation of the Sabrina the Teenage Witch Tale, which is a dark coming-of-age story that traffics in horror and the occult and it's the reimagined origin story of sabrina spellman as she wrestles to dis, um to reconcile her dual nature being half witch and half mortal and how she deals with the evil forces that threaten her family including her two aunts that she lives with um as well as the um friends and and other people uh within the town that she um lives in um so for anybody that grew up in the 90s uh there was sabrina the teenage witch television series that was a comedy um and this is definitely not uh that same version this delves more um more, I think, closely related to the, the comic, which was which was a bit dark. It also, I believe, is by the same production company or uh, producers that make Riverdale, which is the darker tale of Archie. Archie, yeah. Um, so it it's, uh, has a lot of parallels with that. Um, funny in some cases, that dark humor, um, the dark occult uh that i i tend to like um just very well done uh season two will actually be airing uh next month april 5th i believe um so the series came out i believe it was 12 episodes they actually did a christmas episode um over the holidays as well so it starts up again from the reviews that i saw for season two uh some said it was e uh if not better than season one, it was definitely on par. Um, the way that uh, the, the first season went was her deciding whether or not to stay mortal or to go, you know, more towards her witch side. Basically, you know, she comes of age and you have to make a decision. Are you signing the book of the beast or are you, you know, staying mortal forever. And obviously at the end, not to give it away, she signs the book. Um, you, you gave it away. I know, I was kidding. If you read it, you're going to know that that's what happens anyway. So season two picks up with, okay, she signed the book. Now what happens? How does she deal with her mortal friends and everything else and all of these beasts 
uh, that are, are coming after her. Um, so I'm I'm definitely looking forward uh, to so, season two. So have they done a Buffy the Vampire Slayer um, no. musical <laughs> for it yet? No, they haven't. <laughs> One of my best episodes ever or <laughs> favorite episodes <laughs> okay well thank you for that pick michelle not a um, problem joe i did watch one episode with you briefly and uh i definitely can confirm that it is a uh, very dark occult <laughs> which not really my style but nothing wrong with that nope So my insightful pick this week, we're going to go sort of on the geek side with Quark Science. Quark Science is a production uh, available on Amazon Prime Video. Uh, it is a documentary series hosted by British physicist uh, Jim Al-Khalili. Uh, season one consists of six episodes dealing with some of the fundamental questions of science. Um, what I found interesting was about this was it was not originally produced as a series. It was produced as a bunch of standoff episodes. They were packaged up and put on Amazon Prime as a series, uh, or as a season, I should say. Uh, and it's interesting because the time difference varies. You have some of these episodes are two hours long. Some of them are an hour long. Um, but each of them deal with their own fundamental principle of science you've got things such as you know what the series is named after the quark and mm -hmm. dealing with uh subatomic particles you have gravity you have dark matter um there's a there's a number of of topics there i think the first four episodes in the series probably are 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 the best i think the last two in season one they were kind of stretching for material mm -hmm. to do stuff on so they're a little harder to get through um, what was interesting was I think the show presented, um, was presented in a form of a living science project. Um, they take you through the experiments and they take you out and they, they visit various, you know, uh, uh, scientific locations mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, gravity sensors and ex uh, particle accelerators. Like you see where the science is actually being done. So it's a mix of um, lectures and interviews and actual science. I mean, they, at one point in time when they're when they're dealing with gravity, they send a team around England to measure gravity with various devices. Okay, and they base they take that information and then they actually calculate the time dilation effect based on the gravity and your speed and it's just fascinating to see how some of einstein's theories on on relativity are applied to practical daily life okay um and and you can calculate that you age faster in mm -hmm. certain areas than you do in others now okay. that you we're talking microseconds right but, but that it's still it's you can calculate it, it right. it's 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 fascinating the way they apply it um it's a it's a refreshing take on science programming that is often uh, dry and lecture based, where they try to spice things up just with computer graphics. Mm -hmm. This almost feels like you're part of the the science program. Okay. Um, so I highly recommend Quark Science on Amazon Prime. Um, that is my pick of the week. Did you have any closing words, my dear? No, I don't think I did for this week. Um, we do have our contact information is available now. You can visit us on our website uh, at uh, insightsintothings.com. Uh, all of our podcast episodes are up on that site for this series and our other productions. You can email us at comments at insightsintoentertainment.com. Dot com uh, with questions, suggestions, topics you'd like us to talk about, uh, or just feedback on the productions. And I think that's all we have for this week. Okay. We'll be back next week with another great episode. Have a good week, everyone. 